Uh, it, it's actually a great honor for me to be able to introduce this man because uh, one of my first meetings I went, he was, he was a guest speaker and he knocked me out. Extremely impressive. Uh, <clears throat> Joseph Diaguardi. Joseph Diaguardi served in the House of Representatives representing the 20th Congressional District of New York from 1985 to 1989. Joseph Diaguardi is the president of Truth in Government, Inc., a nonprofit organization that informs citizens about the need for transparency and improved practices in congressional budgeting and spending. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to in introduce former Congressman Joseph Diaguardi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tight fit, tight fit. Okay, tight fit, tight fit, tight fit. Tight fit, tight fit. You want to get a look at all of me, right? Hello. Hello. Are you proud to be American? Yes. Yeah. Are you ready to take back America? Yes. Yeah. My father didn't come here to Ellis Island in 1929 to give this country to China. And I'm sure your parents and grandparents didn't even ask. Right? You know, when you look at what's happening today, it makes you sick. We're in a state today that is dysfunctional. Look what's happening with COVID. Look at the corruption. Big shots, I don't want to mention names, are now being put in jail. They're doing stupid things. Laws are being passed, finally, and yet they're not strong enough. We need accountability at all levels. Without accountability, what are you going to get? More corruption, more manipulations, more finagling. This country is too great for that, and this state is too great for that. You know, I think about Ronald Reagan. You remember Ronald Reagan, obviously. Yeah. Good man, right? Yeah. You probably don't remember, word for word, his great speech at the Republican convention when he took on Jimmy Carter. And he faced off to that malaise you remember? And he said about government, great definition of government programs. He said the closest thing to eternal life in Washington is a government program. Once they're in, you can't get them out. And it's the same thing with taxes. Once they put a tax on, oh, it's just going to be temporary. Did you ever see a temporary tax? They keep adding to it. So we got, you know, really big problems. I remember. Ronald Reagan, I'm a human rights activist. I helped the people in the Balkans. My wife, Shirley, who's here. Thank you, Shirley, for coming. She's in the back. My son, John, is here. And I hope you say hello to them, because later, if you didn't get it yet, you want to get the update on my book, Unaccountable Congress. Here it is. This is the book I wrote 17 years ago. I was like pro a prophet, Jeremiah. I forecasted on uh, chapter four. You know what the title of chapter four is? The Big Apple and Washington, one bailout after the other. I predicted that we would be insolvent. I couldn't believe, I can't believe today we're in the shape we are in. I'm going to take you through the numbers. Don't forget, maybe you don't know it. I'm the first practicing certified public accountant ever elected to the U.S. Congress, House or Senate. Can you imagine that? When I got there, I was shocked to find so many attorneys and not one other accountant. So no one's counting, but everybody's spending. And they're spending money they don't have. So what do you do when you spend money you don't have? you got to borrow it. And who are we borrowing from today? China. Countries that don't share our values, like China. We're putting this country on a course of unsustainability. And it's not just for our kids, it's for us. It's not 50 years away, it could be five years away. Look at the debt that's being racked up on the books. Obama himself has said in the next 10 years, he expects to add 10 trillion, that's what the T, 10 trillion to the 12 trillion we just ended the last fiscal year with. That's 22 trillion. Now, even if you could keep interest rates down to 5%, which I don't believe you can because the Federal Reserve has put so much money out there, and we've kind of gained the system by keeping interest rates artificially low. So what we're doing, and I know we have to do that to keep the economy from really cratering, but what's the plan to come out of it? More spending? That means you're going to have huge inflation. You remember when Ronald Reagan gave that speech? Who remembers that the interest rate, the prime rate, was 21%? How could anybody pay 21%? 
That's because inflation was 18%. So you have to always compensate people for lending money by go two or three percent above inflation. Now, get back to my point. I don't think we're going to be able to keep interest rates down to 5%. But let's say we were able to do that. In 10 years, at 5%, $22 trillion, and that's the good news, that's what's on the books. Social Security and Medicare, yeah, 45 trillion more are off the books, and that's what I say over here. But talk about the bond of debt. 22 trillion times 5%, that's over a trillion dollars in interest. That means all discretionary spending will be pushed out. That's the worst tax in the world. You don't have to worry about taxes if you're paying that kind of interest. And look, who are we sending it to? A lot of it's going offshore. We gotta wake up. This is not rocket science. This is accounting. It's not even difficult math. But you get confused every day by these politicians that want to seduce you into thinking they have a program. They have no program. It reminds me of the little story that I heard about that little frog they put in a tank of water and they raised the temperature every day a quarter of a degree. So imperceptible, it felt nice and warm. Guess what happened to that frog? It boiled to death. Did not know enough to jump out. You have to be the people in America today that sound the alarm so that things happen. We don't want to boil to death with what's coming. Now, look what I put on the cover of this book 17 years ago. I left Congress in 1989, and you might say, well, Joe, why aren't you still in Congress? Don't you remember my races? Don't you remember Bella Rapsop, who came from the West Village to Westchester? I had to retire her in 1986. I had the most liberal, democratic district, maybe in America. They got just district. When I said I was going to run, leave Arthur Anderson after 22 years, you know what the people told me? You're crazy. You haven't been in politics. How could you win? That district? you got to be kidding. I took my immigrant parents on both arms and walked on every uh, corner into every store and some bars in Yonkers, and I got every ethnic Democrat you can think of, you know those Reagan Democrats, Irish, Italian, Portuguese, Polish, Ukrainian, they understood my message, because they understood I was the son of immigrants, who worked in his grocery, my father's grocery store, and mother, she worked there too, until we moved to Westchester in 1957, and then I became Joey the waiter at a country club around the corner from where we lived, and then I went to intern in Arthur Anderson, became a partner only 10 years later. Thank God my father and mother, who had no education, sent me to good Jesuit schools, Florida Prep and Florida University, so I could speak a little bit better than they could. My dad spoke broken English. And, but what does that tell you? That's not about me. That's about America. Anybody in America can succeed. Anybody. Because we have to keep this country as the greatest opportunity society that it was and still is today. But you're not going to do it if we're going to fritter away our capital and borrow money from others. So here's what I put on the book as a warning 17 years ago. This is a congressman's credit card. It's a congressman's voting card. I'm holding it. See? By the way, if those of you want some copies of this book, I brought some. But more important, I brought the update. I bridged 17 years ago to today to show you it's much, much worse than I could have ever believed 17 years ago. But here it is. My congressman's voting card, the first chapter of this book, the most expensive credit card in the world is a congressman or congresswoman's voting card. Why? Because every time they put it in the computer to vote, they're pushing up the national debt. That's why we have deficits. So what did I put here? Credit line, unlimited. Expiration date, never. Built to future generations. Here it is. That's what's going on today. Now let's talk about the numbers. At the end of the fiscal year, September 30th, 2009, we know after a deficit, I'm already over. All right, oh, let me give a few numbers. After a deficit of 1 trillion 400 billion, can you imagine? And now this year they're forecasting another deficit of one trillion five hundred billion, but last year the national debt at the end of the year was twelve trillion dollars. Now you would think that's bad, but you know what's worse? We have Enron type accounting in the U.S. government, and we have it in New York State. What does that mean? What killed Enron? 
special purpose entities, SPEs. They kept debt off the books, they kept the losses off the books to keep the earnings high, to seduce shareholders for staying in. They made it an accounting Ponzi scheme. We got it in Washington. Guess what they're called in Washington? GSEs, government-sponsored enterprises. Not on the books, not on the budget, but they can float bonds with the full faith and credit of the United States of America. And let me tell you, there's 28 of them. The Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the uh, Post Office, the, uh, you name it. We got 28 of them. Even the old SNL crisis uh, organization they set up is there. Now, these organizations have deficits. They're supposed to be self-sufficient. That's why they were put off the books, but they're not. Look what happened with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And in my book I said, I think we're gonna, they're gonna be insolvent and we'll have a problem. You know what the people told me 17 years ago? Joe, you're smoking pot. We will never have to come behind those. I said, yeah, but the government is saying if they go under or if they have problems, they are being backed by the full faith and credit of the United States. That's why the interest on those bonds is not that high. Oh, it's never gonna happen. It happened, okay? And we had to come up with the money on the bailout. So what I'm telling you is we have a phony bookkeeping system in Washington. It's not the one that the SEC uses to protect the shareholders. We need to protect the taxpayers as well as the shareholders, and we need to impose the right system that the SEC is imposing. Is that, you like that? Yeah. All right, very simple. Now, Social Security and Medicare. Lyndon Baines Johnson fooled us in 1968. He wanted to disguise the cost of the Vietnam War. So what did he do? He saw all these surpluses in Social Security. Medicare wasn't there, it was just starting. And he said, why should I show a big deficit and wake up the people as to what this war is really costing us? Why don't I just offset the surpluses in those trust accounts against the deficits of the rest of the government and show the net amount? It's called the unified budget. This is the biggest Ponzi scheme ever. It's being used today so that when you get the deficit of a trillion, 400 billion, it's already been reduced by the surpluses in Social Security. So you don't know how really bad it is. You talk about booking the books. New York State, we have 600 authorities in New York State. Are you reading about the MTA? $800 billion deficit? Do you know that's not in the budget of New York State? These are the slush funds. I call them slush funds. These are the SPEs like Enron. They're all off the books. And yet, if you lose an election, the governor will appoint you to a $200,000 job at the Battery Park Authority or the MTA, and then you get a big pension, then you put the overtime into the last three years to make it bigger, and then if you decide to take the pension, you can go back to work and get another job and maybe another pension, and you're sitting here losing your house and your job. Mm -hmm. Don't we have to take back Albany and Washington? Oh, yeah. yeah. Did I always say my name here? No, no, almost perfect. Okay. Can I just conclude? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to keep getting longer, but you know, this is an opportunity to take back America. It's very important. Yes. I don't want anybody to fall asleep. Right, right. <laughs> so, when you talk about 12 trillion and you add 45 trillion for Medicare and Social Security, and you add, God knows, I'm an accountant and I can't figure it out. In fact, when you read my book here, I went through the chronology of all the laws passed in 17 years, and you'll see the bailout laws in here, and I have a paragraph saying, we still don't know what this bailout costs. And if you read the New York Times yesterday, now the Times editorials are saying, and other reporters, you know, we can't figure out what the Fed has spent. And the Fed is lobbying so that you can't audit the Fed. No. Now, we don't want to, you know, mess around with monetary policy, but shouldn't we know what money was put out there, who we lent it to, and should we know which banks? The Fed is saying, we can't tell you which banks got the benefit of these programs because maybe that's going to hurt their com competition or their business. Come on! These are regulated entities. These are not mom and pop grocery stores. They take advantage of licenses we give them federal licenses to become banks. We want to know who was bailed out and how much. And then, and then we have to track to see what happened. Look at the banks today. You know what they're doing? Many of them, I'm not gonna mention names, they're borrowing for practically nothing at the discount window, okay? 
They take the money, instead of giving it to small businesses, they invest it in medium term treasury bills, three, four percent. And look at the profits they're declaring. It's amazing. And what are they doing? Giving bonuses. All right? So there's got to be, listen, I don't want to feed up on the private sector because it's important to have a strong banking system, especially for us. This is New York. You know, New York threw out the blue collar jobs. The port of New York is no longer, it's just a little piece, and I helped save it with Mike Long in Brooklyn. The bulk of it is in Port Elizabeth. We have now the insurance companies and the brokerage firms, and we have the mortgage firms, we have the banks, you name it. We've got all these paper industries. And God forbid they go under, you're going to see a budget hole in Albany like you can't believe. And then you'll see a, a, a real tax bill. When you are a junior member of the minority party, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Money breaks up up. That's the bill that I passed 20 years ago. This year is the 20th anniversary of the Chief Financial Officer and Federal Financial Management Act of 1990. Which signed it 20 years later, okay? Not easy to do when you're a junior member of the minority party. Don't forget, when I was there, the House and Senate were controlled by Democrats. If you don't make some kind of discussion with them, you can't get these passed. Now, in the back, of the in the back you will have uh, my book, you will have this, and you'll see what we did, and you'll have, I think you've got my bio for it, okay? And if you're curious, yes, that is my daughter, Kara, who's on the judge on American Idol. All right? And I'm going to tell you now, that young lady signed in all my things when she was a little girl, and she's coming in to help her father. Gerrymandering. How do you fix that problem? What do you think about it? Is it fixable to go to a new system? Is it possible to go to a new system? Who's the question? Uh, Joe, you want to handle that? Sure. This is one of the biggest problems we have today, that you can design these artificial districts by computer, and Republicans are re protecting Republicans because they're getting more Republican votes in the district by computer. The same with Democrats. It's kind of like, you know, I won't fight you if you don't fight me. And that's why less than 50 percent, excuse me, 50 seats out of 435 are competitive today. Look what happened to me when I tried to come back with Dita Lowy, Governor Cuomo, a Democrat. And this was two months before the race. Imagine, after 10 years, I still don't know what my seat is that I'm going to run in because they had to do this political manipulation. And I find out two months before that they put a third of my district across the, the uh, Throgs Neck Bridge. It went for uh, a mile, a block wide, till it got to where Nita Lowy and Cuomo did their business back then with the Democratic Party, Hollis Hills and, and Forest Hills. So I had to go then to a place that I never did any visit with. This is what's going on in America. It was done because it had a political objective, incumbency. People want to stay in. Now, you know, term limits, we tried to get it there, it didn't work. But you know, our founding fathers didn't see a couple of major things. One, a balanced budget amendment was not put in the Constitution. It should have been there. Very difficult to get it. The other thing is term limits. They couldn't have imagined, because their idea was that it was kind of a a citizen situation that you'd go to Congress, represent your, your neighbors, and you'd come back. It was basically a part-time job. But now we've got this incumbency. How do you change it? It's like, how do you change everything else? The people have to speak up. They have to get angry, and they got to change it. And the way you change it is you have to target some of these seats and, and get people out. I don't know that you can do it overnight, but I think we can change it, because it's not fair. My name is Ed Magliola from the Left Freedom Ring Group out of Suffern, New York. I respect the gentleman's opinion that he doesn't think it's the right time. But by God, if, if it isn't the right time now, it'll never be. Exactly right. Right. I have a question. I have, I have a question for the panel, if I may. Uh, we have, we have two senators in our state right now, uh, Senator Schumer and Senator, and Senator Gilbert. Oh, no! 
how do we get these rubber stamp senators out of office? Look at what's happening now as we speak to this senator, Gillibrand, that was not elected, she was appointed. She was appointed by a governor that came in because of Spitzer. And now you have Schumer saying to his own party, don't run against her, we don't want to weaken her. That's not America. She's got to show that she can compete. And we need more challenges, and we need more elections right. to get the best people and the best ideas. And she's also traveling throughout the New York State with a, a self Van Jones. A self-devout communist party Van by Van Jones. Well, there you go. So this is what we have to be attuned to and try to change it. And uh, hopefully I'll do something about it. Hi, Mr. Uh, Diaguardi, uh, I have a question for you. Um, I, uh, My own stamping grounds in Bronx. I was born and raised there. We moved to Westchester in 1957. Well, I'm not going to make this comfortable for you. I'm sorry. Just be able to <laughs> okay. Um... There's Bar nothing comfortable when you're in Congress. Bar <laughs> Barney Frank and, and Chris Dodd are responsible for the for the uh, housing bubble uh, crisis with uh, the CRA and um, and uh, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, and I read your very impressive resume and see that you come out of Arthur Anderson and Company. 22 years now. Who was also uh, on the other side of the issue uh, with the collapse of, I think it was MCI and Tyco, um, if I remember right. I don't remember the company. That was Enron. 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 after my time. Don't forget. Okay. I, I'm All right. Well, it's in, it's in the resume, and I just wanted to be fair sure. to make sure that <laughs> the vetting was complete. Yeah. And let, me, let me say something about that. You want to talk about prosecutorial, uh, tutorial hubris? Arthur Anderson, 50,000 jobs were lost. They should have gone after three partners yeah. in Texas, not the firm. They consolidated the industry, and when they went to the Supreme Court, Arthur Anderson won 9-0, but the firm was finished. Right. One of the greatest firms of all time. The firm, it was called the Marines of the Accounting Profession. That's where I learned government, government accounting and private sector accounting because it was Arthur Anderson that was hired in 1975 to unbundle the screwball books of New York City so we could see whether or not they were entitled to a bailout. I was one of the young partners put on that team. That's where I learned the gimmicky kind of accounting that they use in government versus the private sector. So let's not bury Arthur Anderson. They did their job. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, sir, with the, with the Navy hat. Okay, my name is Matt Chalmers. I'm from Japan. I'd just like to know something. Yeah. Um, we have Obama and to be president for three more years. We have to wait until November before we change the uh, Congress. Uh, how do we stop Obama from getting away with his executive privilege? Who's the question? With what he can do with his executive privilege. Yeah. Okay, oh, is it Joe? Okay, Joe. <laughs> Joe. Well, you know, executive privilege. We, we have a country that is based on checks and balances, but you have the wrong president. That's the problem. Uh, you know, it was designed in such a way, and it's amazing that it's lasted and worked as long as it has, as you heard before, with the three branches and then even the house separated in a bicameral way to two houses. Uh, executive privilege cannot be changed unless you get in someone that you trust to do the right thing. Now, if a president does do something, we would hope that there'd be a Congress in the other party that might be able to change it by law. But we don't have that right now. We have the worst of all worlds. We have the House, the Senate, and the White House controlled by the same party. And, no and this media. is a... And, no no media. Media. And, and that's the other thing. So we have a problem, and that's why you're here today. Everybody's fed up with the way things are working. Let me also say something about that, sir. So let me also say something that there are certain iconic races that we sent a message, as I mentioned, in Virginia. New Jersey and Massachusetts. John Murtha just died. He was a very powerful and uh, very controversial congressman. His seat will be uh, open and the election will probably be announced for May 18th. As a lot of us did to help uh, Scott Brown win, pay attention to this and the candidate, uh, possibly Tim Ross, I believe, will be able to use your support as well. 
this will help send a message, another message to the president, and another message to Congress that we won't take any more. Yeah. Hey, let, let me just have a question. Tell me the microphone. You have to have the microphone. Yes, sir, in the green shirt. Okay. I'm on the Jonas Jonas Alma. I'm from uh, Pearl River. I'm a plumbing contractor, which I guess makes me original. Joe the plumber. Joe the plumber. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Does it come to that question with every one of these issues that we've been talking about, and it all boils down to the Federal Reserve. And I guess we'll address this to Joe since he's a CPA. But the Federal Reserve basically is a group of banks, if I'm not mistaken, a cabal, if you will, that lend us money that doesn't exist and then charges us interest on it. And we pay federal income tax, 100% of your federal income tax goes to pay that debt off every year and just the interest. We haven't touched the original debt from World War I yet. So uh, maybe Joe could... Yeah, that's the one of the Well, yeah, that's, that's where you start. I mean, you could have a seminar on this. The Fed right now is a black box. We know that. And, it, you know, you've got two major components in government. You've got monetary policy, and that's where you set interest rates, and you expand the money supply when you need it or contract it. And then you have fiscal policy, which is taxing and spending. That's really what the House initiates. The Fed has a role because we need to have someone independent of government looking at the economic reality. But it has to be transparent. We should know how much money is being printed. We should know which banks are getting the most from the bailouts. And we should know pretty much the balance sheet of the Fed, which we don't because they don't allow an audit. Well, they just recently didn't push his administration. They uh, outlawed the F factor, which was the amount of which is the amount of the money in, in circulation. We don't know that now. Yeah. That used to be a common thing. Well, at the end of the fiscal year. Okay. Of the well, all well, I know is that Bush allowed Mr. Greenspan to come in, and Mr. Greenspan, after he was praised for years and years and years, he was practically in tears as he said, I, I, I made a mistake. I did not know that human nature could override economic principles and put us in that trouble. So we, we have to examine all aspects of government because we need to restructure government. We're doing this right now in Westchester County. As I said in my speech book, I didn't give you the bottom line. I'm now working with a group of people to restructure Westchester County government. Out of 3,000 counties, we have the highest taxes in America. People are voting with their feet. So we put up a petition. You're going to have it in the back. If you're in Westchester County, sign it, because we're going to get rid of the county board of legislators and go back to what we had, a board of supervisors that doesn't get paid. Yeah. The current payers and the super supervisors will be yeah. at home. So in the back, I'll be there afterwards. Sign, and now that's citizen action. You can change something.